Picture this, a country with no rivers, almost entirely covered in desert, somehow delivers fresh drinking water to nearly 38 million people every single day. Not through magic, but through 14,217 kilometers of pipeline, more than twice the length of the Nile River, snaking through sand dunes and punching through mountains nearly 10,000 feet high. This is Saudi Arabia's water network, and it's one of the most extreme infrastructure projects on Earth. But here's what makes it fascinating. They're not moving water from one place to another. They're creating it from scratch, in the middle of the desert, using the ocean. Saudi Arabia covers about 2.15 million square kilometers, Rainfall averages less than 100 millimeters per year, that's about 4 inches. For comparison, London gets about 24 inches annually and some inland zones of the Rub al Khali have gone entire decades with no measurable rain at all. Stretches so dry that the only water you'll ever see there is what you carry in yourself. For centuries, the population survived on ancient underground aquifers and seasonal wadis, dry riverbeds that only flow after rare rainstorms. Bedouin tribes mastered the art of finding hidden seeps and digging wells hundreds of meters deep by hand. But when oil wealth transformed the country in the 1970s, everything changed. Cities exploded in size, industries emerged, subsidized wheat farming turned the desert green for a while. The population grew from about 3.6 million in 1970 to nearly 38 million today. The aquifers couldn't keep up. By the 1990s, groundwater levels were dropping fast. The Dissi Aquifer in the north fell more than 150 meters in places. The Sac Aquifer, once a vast fossil reservoir laid down 500 million years ago, was losing billions of cubic meters annually. Satellite imagery from NASA showed massive cones of depression, dark circles of overpumping visible from space. The country faced a choice import water, which was impractical at this scale, or create it themselves. They chose creation. Today, desalination provides roughly 70% of domestic and municipal drinking water, about 9.7 million cubic meters per day. That's 22 to 25% of the entire world's desalinated water production, all from one country. But producing the water was only half the battle. The real engineering insanity was getting it inland, uphill, across 800 kilometers of scorching emptiness. The Saline Water Conversion Corporation, SWCC, operates what is almost certainly the world's longest integrated desalinated water transmission system. The network's true challenge isn't just length, it's topography and temperature. Saudi Arabia isn't flat. The western edge is guarded by the Sarawak Mountains, a 1,700-kilometer escarpment that rises like a wall from the Red Sea. Peaks top 3,700 meters. Cities like Abha sit at 2,270 meters, higher than Denver. Taif at 1,879 meters. Even Riyadh, 467 kilometers inland, sits on a high desert plateau 600 meters above sea level. Moving water uphill requires enormous amounts of energy. The original Riyadh Water Transmission System, or RWTS, completed in 1983, was already a monster. It pumps water from Jubail on the Persian Gulf 467 kilometers inland and lifts it more than 600 vertical meters to the capital using multiple booster stations and pipes up to 80 inches wide. When it first came online, it delivered 830,000 cubic meters per day, enough to fill about 330 Olympic swimming pools every single day. And just this year, in 2025, they more than doubled that capacity with the brand new Parallel JR WTS line. Imagine building that original system, the one that was already mind-blowing, back in the 1970s and 80s, when crews of thousands toiled in 50 degrees Celsius heat where a single dust storm could bury a section of pipeline overnight. It meant solving problems most engineers never see in a lifetime, starting with the sheer brutality of the environment. Ground temperatures could soar to 80 degrees Celsius, causing metal to warp and expand like it was alive. Early attempts saw pipes buckle and joints fail, so teams learned to bury them deep under layers of stabilizing sand and add flexible loops to absorb the daily swell and shrink. Then there was the endless sand itself, shifting dunes that swallowed machinery whole during construction. One 400-kilometer stretch between Jubail and Riyadh meant carving a trench across shifting dunes and bedrock, a corridor so vast that just grading the right-of-way and burying the pipe moved enough sand and rock to fill a line of dump trucks stretching from London to Moscow. 
corrosion lurked everywhere too. The salty source water inside, the abrasive desert air outside, and even underground gases that gnawed at the coatings. Modern fixes, like tough epoxy layers and electrical safeguards, came later. Early lines were trial by fire, but they held. And don't get us started on the mountains. The old route to the Western Highlands twisted 240 kilometers around the escarpment, wasting energy and time. In 2020, SWCC changed the game with the Al Harda Tunnel, a 12.5 kilometer bore straight through granite, wide as a house, drilled with precision to keep the water's flow just right, steep enough for gravity, shallow enough for the pumps. Two massive boring machines finished it in 19 months, saving 40 kilometers of pipe and slashing energy use by 15%. Up north, routes climb even higher, to 907 meters near Ha'il, stepping up with 11 pumping stations powered by their own mini-grids. The technology itself has undergone two revolutions. Back in the beginning, it was all about brute force. The 1970s through the early 2000s ran on multi-stage flash distillation, basically giant boilers that superheated seawater to 110 degrees Celsius, flashed it into steam across dozens of stages, and condensed the fresh water. The monsters built then, like Jubail Phase 1 and 2 in the 1980s, are still standing today. Stainless steel cathedrals that could each make almost a million cubic meters a day, but they burned a ridiculous 20 to 25 kilowatt hours for every single cubic meter. That's like running 10 household air conditioners non-stop just to fill one bathtub. Then came the 2010s and everything flipped. Saudi Arabia switched almost overnight to reverse osmosis. Energy use collapsed from 20 plus kilowatt hours down to under two kilowatt hours per cubic meter in the newest plants. Suddenly they were turning seawater into drinking water for about 30 cents a cubic meter, cheaper than London or Los Angeles pay for river water. And now they're even doing it with sunshine. The Al Kafji plant runs completely off solar during the day, pumping out 60,000 cubic meters with zero grid power. Result? In just 45 years, they went from almost nothing to 11.5 million cubic meters of fresh water every single day. Enough to fill the Great Pyramid of Giza six times over, every 24 hours. But no mega project this big comes without serious trade-offs. Energy is the obvious one. Even today, making and pumping drinking water consumes roughly the same electricity as the entire country of Belgium. Brine is the second headache. Every day, the plants push 15 to 18 million cubic meters of hypersaline waste back into the Gulf. The newest facilities use long diffuser pipes so salinity barely rises, but some older sites have created dead zones on the seabed where almost nothing lives. Then there's agriculture, still 85% of total water use, almost all of it non-renewable fossil water. The kingdom famously ended its water-guzzling wheat program in 2016. It took 3,000 litres to grow a single kilo of wheat, but alfalfa for dairy remains the next frontier. Maintenance is relentless. A one millimeter pinhole in a high pressure line can shoot a jet strong enough to slice steel. SWCC keeps its own fleet of helicopters and 1,200 rapid response vehicles on 24 seven alert because in the middle of the desert, a major rupture can empty a city's reserves in hours. Yet the vision keeps pushing forward. Vision 2030 targets 90% of urban water from desalination and at least 60% wastewater reuse by 2030. They're already at approximately 30% and climbing fast. New strategic reservoirs, like the 100 million cubic meter Jurena Dam near Mecca, will act as insurance for the Hajj if plants ever go offline. Kaust labs are testing graphene and next-gen membranes that run three times faster than today's RO, meaning future plants will be cheaper, greener, and even larger. The bill since the early 2000s? Roughly $180 billion invested in water infrastructure alone, more than the annual GDP of Portugal. Because when your country is 98% desert and 38 million people need to drink tomorrow, water isn't infrastructure, it's survival. And that refusal to accept the limits of geography is the real story behind this impossible lifeline. Saudi Arabia's water network is a testament to what happens when a nation refuses to accept the limits of geography. It is expensive, energy hungry, and environmentally complicated. But every morning, 38 million people turn on a tap in one of the driest places on earth, and clean water comes out. 
In a country that once measured wealth in camels and dates, water has quietly become the most valuable resource of all. Other nations facing freshwater collapse, think North Africa, the American Southwest, Northern China, are studying the Saudi model closely. The technology exists. The question is whether anyone else has the will, the money, and the desert-sized ambition to copy it. For now, in a land where water was once literally worth more than oil, the taps keep running. And that in itself is one of the greatest engineering stories ever told. If you found this deep dive into Saudi Arabia's impossible water lifelines as mind-blowing as we did, you're going to love what's coming next on Unimaginable Builds. We're uncovering the world's most ambitious engineering projects, the ones that shouldn't exist but do. Next time, we're taking you inside another build that's rewriting the rules of what a country can be, but you'll only catch it if you're subscribed. Smash that subscribe button, ring the bell, drop a like if this one earned it. Every thumbs up helps more people discover these stories. Until next time, this is Unimaginable Builds, where we explore the infrastructure that pushes the very edge of possible.